Welcome to the Mindfulness Meditation Podcast. I'm your host, Dawn Eshelman. Every Wednesday at the Rubin Museum of Art in Chelsea, we present a meditation session led by a prominent meditation teacher from the New York area. This podcast is a recording of our weekly practice. If you would like to join us in person, please visit our website at rubinmuseum.org meditation. We are proud to be partnering with Sharon Salzberg and the teachers from the Interdependence Project and the New York Insight Meditation Center. In the description for each episode, you will find information about the theme for that week's session, including an image of a related artwork chosen from the Rubin Museum's permanent collection. And now, please enjoy your practice. It's a delight, as always, to have Sharon Salzberg in the house. And um, as you know, she is the co-founder of the Insight Meditation Society in Barrie, Massachusetts. She's been studying and teaching for over 45 years, and she's the author of some fabulous books, many of which you can find upstairs in the shop. And um, that includes her most recent book, Real Happiness at Work. Please welcome Sharon Salzberg. Hello. It's so beautiful, isn't it, the art? Every time I'm going to speak here, they um, kindly send me like three things to choose from, uh, you know, in terms of the topic. So I get an explanation of how it might fit the topic, which is really useful. Uh, So I get to see it early on and and make a choice, which is wonderful. And I just thought, this is like the most beautiful thing. The colors are so warm. And here we are. So how great. And uh, what a nice topic for such a cold season in so many ways. Um, When... uh, I think about gratitude, of course, I think about many things, but oddly enough, one of the things I think about is distraction and how likely it is there would be so many things I would feel grateful for in my ordinary everyday life if I only were to notice them instead of being so distracted. Um, The Buddha said something like, Uh, There are two very rare and precious kinds of individuals in this world, one who is generous and one who is grateful. And yet I think in terms of generosity, one of the um, big hindrances or, or hurdles we have to get over is the idea that we don't have enough, we are not enough, what we offer could never be enough, and to rejoice in just the act of offering, even if it's, you know, not the vast amount of money that is going to solve some seemingly intractable problem, or even if it's not the end of someone else's distress, it's, it's being present with them, you know, it's smiling at them, it's acknowledging their, their worth, something like that. And to, to do the good that's in front of us, even if it doesn't seem so immense, You know, if we can get through that hurdle of misunderstanding and recognize, just do it, just offer it. You know, just be present or um, just give what you can give reasonably. Um, That's a beautiful contribution. It's a beautiful element of participation. And the same thing with with gratitude. Um, You know, we don't necessarily feel grateful for the ordinary things or, or the things that we, we, clearly we don't feel gratitude for the things we take for granted or, or we're somewhat complacent about. And I can remember, it's funny, it's not exactly this, but it, I'm reminded of this. Um, well, I went to a conference once, uh, many years ago in San Francisco, and it was a, a magnificent conference and um, tremendous, you know, the Dalai Lama was there and, you know, all kinds of speakers were there and eminent uh, no, other Nobel laureates and, you know, it was, it was just this amazing gathering and, and every 
talk on the stage was was intense and provocative and interesting and and yet the real takeaway the one thing i clearly remember from the conference was a conversation i accidentally overheard <laughs> backstage you know i was walking through and uh, the writer, Alice Walker, was talking to a group of people. And I was just walking by. And I overheard her say something like, as I get older, the thing that matters to me more than anything is goodness. It's good heartedness. And I you know, went off into the other room. <laughs> and all these years later, that's what I remember and treasure. And I think, how many conversations do we kind of overhear or you know, we're not really a part of, but we're witnessing. We get to witness or, you know, something that, that's going on that's not the um, main event. I mean, I've met really, really good friends sitting next to them in some program. You know, I actually don't remember the program as much as I think, hey, I have a friend now, <laughs> you know? So there's a lot that we may not notice because it's routine, it's ordinary, it's expected, or it's not what we expected, it's not what we're there for. Um, we're distracted. And that's why it's such a tremendous discipline and such a source of joy to make it a practice, to recollect. You know, if you have that kind of determination or dedication, like every night I'm gonna write down three things I'm grateful for from the day, you'll start to notice more. You should think, well, it's five o'clock. All I have so far is that I'm breathing. <laughs> you know, like, what's good? <laughs> what's going on? And I find, you know, I really love New York City. I know a lot of people have mixed feelings about the place we are at. Um, I'm here as an adult, uh, not full time, but often here um, in my sublet apartment. Uh, somebody asked me how long I was going to stay, and I said, as long as I have an apartment. <laughs> um, and uh, sometimes people who know me from Barry, Massachusetts, which is you know, rural, peaceful, tranquil, calm, pretty, full of trees, um, they, they run into me like it's some program in New York, and, and they'll say to me, are you OK? <laughs> like, are you OK here in New York? And I say, it's a choice. Like, no one's making me be here. I want to be here. And part, I, partly I realize that one of the things that delights me about New York City is these kind of overheard conversations or you know, just encounters with a salesperson or um, bus driver or certainly taxi driver, uh, you know, that are, are just these openings. And you go, wow, look at that. And I could have sat here like sullen. Um, when you say uh, my book, Real Happiness at Work, my favorite story in there uh, actually comes from a taxi driver. Um, where I was, I was here in the city, uh, around this area, uh, trying to get Midtown to hear the Vietnamese Zen teacher Thich Nhat Hanh give a lecture. And I'd left getting a taxi a little late. And this was before, you know, all those other options. And uh, so I was trying to get a taxi right at that time when the shift is changing and it's so difficult. and. Uh, you know, as the taxis do occasionally, they stop and they, the driver will, you know, open the window and say, where are you going? And if your destination is close to where they need to drop off the cab before they go off uh, from work, they'll take you as the last trip of the day. So that's what happened. I got in this guy's cab and we got stuck in the most immense, overwhelming, unthinkable, unbearable traffic. I'd never seen anything like it. And first I thought, forget Thich Nhat Hanh, I'm never going to make it. And then I felt really bad for the guy. You know, I thought he was nice enough to pick me up. And he was going to be incredibly late, no doubt, turning in the cab. And 
I don't know what happens when you're late turning in the cab. Do you get fined or, you know, do you get penalized in some way? So I said to him, I am so sorry. I'm so, so sorry. I've just, I've never seen traffic like this. This is unbelievable. You were so nice to pick me up. I know you're going to be late. I'm so, so sorry. And first he said to me, Madam, traffic is not your fault. <laughs> and then he said, nor is it mine. <laughs> and I thought, wow, I don't have to see Thich Nhat Hanh. <laughs> you know? I just had an enlightened cab driver. Like, wow. I mean, especially that second one, like, nor is it mine. Because I thought, how many times a day is he likely blamed for something that's not his fault? You know, a bridge is closed, there's terrible traffic, there's some crazy driver on the road. And to have that kind of self-possession, like, nor is it mine. So I was like, wow. And then he got me there with, like, zero seconds to spare. I don't know if you've ever, when Thich Nhat Hanh was, you know, still touring and stuff, if you ever saw him, you know, he's, like, incredibly dignified walking on the stage, and I was running to my seat, <laughs> all flustered. But it actually hardly mattered, because there it was. That was the, the precious jewel of the day, right? Nor is it mine. So let's pay attention to what we have, what is kind of the bounty. You know, this, we're wired, evolutionary psychologists say, to see threat, to see danger. And there's actually a lot of that, genuinely so. It's not all imagination. But it's not all there is. You know, we live in a world where there are these Jew-like wisdom holders and where people are actually looking out for one another and kind of helping each other and taking care of each other as well. And so... Let's spend some time really consciously. It's not, sometimes people don't like practices like that. It feels forced or phony or coerced, but it doesn't have to be. It's really like, let's have an adventure. You know, I'm the kind of person who comes to the end of the day, and all I think about is what I can complain about. Let's see what happens <laughs> when I think, what are three things I can also be grateful for? You can do the complaints, too, if you want, you know? <laughs> But they'll come more automatically and like spend some time intentionally saying, what's it like to also notice the gifts that are genuinely mine in, in this life? OK, so let's sit together. See if your back can be straight without being strained or overarched, and just relax. You can start, if you like, by listening to sound, whether it's the sound of my voice or other sounds. Just let the sounds come and go and wash through you. <coughs> now, that same open, relaxed awareness, bring your attention to the feeling of your breath the actual sensations of your in and out breath, just the normal, natural breath, however it's appearing, however it's changing, wherever you feel it most distinctly, nostrils, chest, or abdomen. You can find that place. Bring your attention there and rest. See if you can feel one breath.
If you like, you can use a quiet mental notation, like in, out, or rising, falling, to help support the awareness of the breath, but very quiet. So your attention is really going to feeling the breath, one breath at a time. If you find your attention's wandered, you've been lost in thought, spun out in a fantasy, you've fallen asleep, don't worry about it. Once you realize that's happened, see if you can gently let go and just bring your attention back to the feeling of the breath.
Thank you. See you next year. Yeah. That concludes this week's practice. If you'd like to attend in person, please check out our website, rubenmuseum.org slash meditation to learn more. Sessions are free to Rubin Museum members, just one of the many benefits of membership. Thank you for listening. Have a mindful day.